All right. Well, I take a little break because I had to go fuck Karina. I thought about dudes, though, while I did it. I mean, I know weirdo. If you know what I mean. That was weird. All right. So we're going to start a new series here. Um, if you're watching this, you're in the $20 tier or above. Um, you guys will be getting gifts. Um, I, I did the RIP Paul Harper email. I have an assistant that's going to catalog that, send it out. We're still working on an Etsy site, but we'll just do that for like next month. I don't think I'm going to do um, gifts next month. I think I'll make it clear that it'll just be storyline. Plus you guys will get, you know, private um, VIP lives. I think I'll probably only do lives for VIP from this point forward. No, like all of Patreon um, included. And I don't really want to ever do lives on YouTube anymore, even though I get money from donations, but I don't really care feel like giving me a donation, like I've said, send it to charity. Uh, there's a ton of people that are starving right now, and I'd rather them get money than me. I'm cool. I appreciate your um, monthly subscription. <clears throat> it definitely helps provide for my family, but I'm, I'm not, like, I'm cool. I don't need more than what you guys are already doing. So, you know, this point forward, if you ever want to give me a donation, I'd much rather it go to, like, people that actually, like, aren't working and could use it. Um, or you can make a donation to the Paul Project, which um, I've already started the steps to get the 501C. It costs like almost 700. I thought it was gonna be like five or six, but it costs more than that. It's okay. Once I have the nonprofit tax exempt status, I'll be able to do more. <clears throat> wow, I'm having trouble breathing right now. Okay, we're going. So this is gonna be a China series and Basically, um, you know, my dad took me to China, Taiwan, Japan in 2002 in the middle of me being addicted to heroin. So I went there strung out. This episode is going to kind of um, give you an idea of what happened leading up to that trip so that you know exactly where I was at at that point in my life when I went to China. I think it's pretty interesting. You don't have to like, comment, subscribe, do shit. This is VIP. This is deep, dark in the trenches of Patreon. Very few people ever see this series. So let's start making more exclusive stuff for your tier so that you know how special you guys are. Um, I definitely want to earn your business. So let's, let's get to it. Um, so when I was a sophomore in high school, um, I'd gone back to Santa Barbara High the public school that I got expelled from when I was a freshman. I got expelled from three schools my freshman year, uh, Santa Barbara High, then Midland Boarding School where I met uh, Riggy Mars, and then I went to uh, Bishop Diego, which was like a private, um, you know, uh, Catholic school. And I got expelled from that, but for having like a little piece of weed on my pants. Then my parents sent me away. I went to the survival school in Idaho, and then I went to the residential treatment center lockdown place in Utah. I got out, went back to Santa Barbara High, the place that I had gotten expelled from. And someone had broken in. I've told the story in the juvenile delinquency series. Someone had broken into the classroom and tagged up the entire school. So somebody like broke the windows in one of the classrooms, went with spray paint, did graffiti all over the entire high school. I hung out with a lot of skaters, drug addicts, um, butt fuck bandits, slutty women that weren't women yet. They were just slutty girls at the time. And uh, ravers, graffiti artists, basically just degenerates. I mean, surprise, surprise. That's what my social circle was like at that point in my life. So because I hung out with a lot of taggers and I did a lot of tagging myself as well, um, they would all do graffiti on my binder like really like intricate, you know, uh, color graffiti pieces. So you guys know this story. Um, when the tagging incident occurred, security kind of like went through the classrooms trying to find a set, like a, you know, one of the suspects or trying to find whoever had done it. They saw that I had a bunch of tagging on my binder. Um, they went to question me. I had a purple Jansport backpack on. I had a bunch of bud in there because I was selling, I think it was like two ounces or something. 
maybe a QP. I think it was two ounces though. And uh, they wanted to search my backpack in the assistant principal's office. I said, no, we wrestled. Um, they ended up finding the weed. I got arrested for marijuana sales. So I was 16. I got arrested for marijuana sales. And I told them, like, they're like, well, if you tell us where you, you got the weed, we'll let you go. So I just been kicked out of a party by this guy. His name was Andy Norton. He was a, uh, like, uh, one of the like big Christian kids at our school. And he had been dating, um, my ex-girlfriend cat. And because he was dating her, um, after me. So I was her boyfriend before he ever was, you know, she dated me. I was in eighth grade and she was in ninth grade. Then she went, you know, the, the following year she was in 10th grade and I was in ninth grade. She started dating this guy, Andy, and uh, he had kicked me out of a party. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 aren't you like a junkie? You can't come in here. And it was a list party. It really embarrassed me. It happened the weekend before I got arrested for selling weed and the graffiti incident. So when they asked me where I got the weed, I blamed it on him. Does this ring a bell? And because like the church had donated a um, Z3 BMW convertible to him. So I was like, well, yeah, look at the car he drives. <laughs> you think that he didn't get that kind of convertible um, just selling Boy Scout cookies, Cub Scout cookies, did you? No, he's a fucking marijuana kingpin, duh. And they're like, really? like, you know, the little narcotics detected in Santa Barbara, a bunch of lames, took down all of his information. Uh, you know, they were like, gonna let me go, but I was gonna get expelled from the school. So I was like, hey, can you like walk me like down the hall, like while I'm handcuffed? And they're like, yeah. And so, you know, everyone said, I was like, make love. And, you know, people had commented that when I told the story in the juvenile delinquency series, I was like, fuck you, you fucking pigs, you stupid pieces of shit. And like girls were like, oh my God, like flashing me. And so I like walk, but no, that didn't happen. But you know what I mean? Uh, it looked kind of like made me look cool. And subsequently, his house got raided. <laughs> his car got raided. I thought it was hilarious. I went and told that. I was like, yeah, I did that. A piece of shit kicked me out of a party. Fucking got revenge. I would never do that now. You know, I told like, I've been in prison and I've told hardcore convicts that story. And like, they think it's funny. They don't look at it as snitching. It was like high school hijinks. Like, get this dude in trouble. Because he was the most squeaky clean uh, like hardcore Christian kid at our school he just happened to be driving a BMW convertible. So like the narrative that I presented seemed pretty believable. So I got expelled. Um, and I didn't get, I, well, I, yeah, I got put on some sort of summary probation for it too, but I didn't get charged. It's kind of like a deal. Like I'd have to check in with someone or so. I don't know. It was a really long time ago. Well, what had happened is my parents had adopted my best friend and he was like, just like me. He was like a really bad drug addict. Um, he had like short buzzed hair that he bleached like M&Ms. I had short buzzed hair that I like had dyed dark black. And like, I don't know, we listened to a lot of punk rock and we got in a lot of fist fights and we had sex with a lot of sluts. We were pretty cool people. Um, we turned out, we turned out fine. So <laughs> that was the way to go in high school. Um, he actually ended up turning, I mean, that's a whole different story. But yeah, I'm not friends with that guy anymore. He's a piece of shit. But uh, anyway, my parents had adopted him. So around the time that I'd gotten expelled, his name was Sean. I won't say that like on YouTube because I don't even want to give this piece of shit that much credit. And as we get like later into, um, as we get later, like into the storyline, you'll know like why I hate this guy as much as I do. He's a total scumbag, but Sean was living with me and we had gotten into cocaine probably, I don't know. Um, you know, I told you guys the story where some senior girls were like smoke or snorting it out of a little bullet. Um, this, I have a bullet here. Hold on. Uh, it's kind of suspect. Why do I have a bullet? This is a bullet. So what you do with this is, um, I just happened to have that on my desk. So you get this, I like, get a head shop, right? You unscrew this and you put cocaine inside of this and then you screw it back together screw it back together, 
You hear me see how I sound? I don't talk like that. And then you go like this. And you, like this little lever makes like the bump of cocaine come out of the vial and then you're like, <laughs> looks super suspicious when you're driving. You're like, man, this song's bomb as fuck. <laughs> you like look over, someone's like, oh. I'm just like, fuck it. I'm so coked out. I'm just going to turn the music up. Fuck you. <laughs> You know, like just keep driving very common in los angeles so anyway so um you know that's how i'd gotten into coke now it was around the time when sean had moved in and you know, my parents remember that whole thing where we were on mushrooms and um you know the guy in the front door of the mustang front part of the the door of the mustang he opened it we were on a one-way street car came knocked the door off and sean's parents beat the shit out of him his mom is like a straight up whore um who's tried to suck my dick multiple times. She calls me, she's like, hey, because she's a heroin addict now too. He turned her out, which is, they have a weird dynamic. And there's actually a rumor that they took ecstasy and had sex on a cruise ship. Yeah, mother and son, pretty mellow. Um, but she'd like call me and she'd be like, hey, um, do you have a half gram? Like two in the morning, I'd be like, no, I don't. You know, I'd have like five kilos back when I was selling it. <sighs> okay, what if I suck your cock? Yeah, I still don't have a half gram. I got to go. Uh, I don't know why I went into that weird uh, little offshoot right there. But anyway, the point is, is um, his parents had beat him up really badly where he had to go to the hospital. We were on mushrooms at the time too. And I had to like walk home in the rain. My parents ended up taking, you know, uh, getting custody of him. So now, just so, you know, and I, I brought you back just in case you forgot some of those details. So now I was, he was still in Santa Barbara High. So he's still going to high school. He was living with me. So he lived in the guest room and then I had like my own bedroom and it was pretty cool. Like, you know, like girls would come over in the middle of the night. We were just like really debaucherous and we did a lot of drugs and he was like an acid freak like me. We did acid all the time and we got into heroin together and we got really into cocaine together. So I believe it was... I don't know, whenever I think I got expelled, I was already doing about an eight ball of cocaine a day. So that's like 3.5 grams of Coke, uh, which is a lot, you know, back then it cost us like, I don't know, 80 bucks, 90 bucks, goes all the way up to like 120 for an eight ball of like pretty shitty Coke. Real Coke, I've said a million times, costs about 300 for an eight ball. If you're paying like 100, 120 a ball, which is like what most commercial cocaine goes for, ugh. Yuck. That's all I have to say. So, um, we, but back then, this was right after 9 11, like 2002, and cocaine was still pretty good and it wasn't that expensive. I think it was like 80 bucks a gram. He was working at a local hamburger restaurant, like a, like a high end burger spot, um, like a sit down restaurant, but they specialized in burgers and he would get a lot of tip money. And I was working for a telemarketing place after I'd gotten expelled from Santa Barbara High my sophomore year. We got in really, really, really got into cocaine around that time. Um, and I mean, we would snort coke all day, every day. Snort it off double CD cases and we listen to Pink Floyd, The Wall. And like there was this part on that album where there's like a helicopter where it's like, do, 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 and we'd always like, snort coke to that part and like try to do as much as we could and then we'd like go um buy m and m mcflurries at mcdonald's i don't know why that was just like kind of our thing pink floyd wall helicopter sounds cocaine snorting it then uh m and m mcflurries at mcdonald's it was pretty cool it's pretty chilly and uh so you know we get deeper deeper into cocaine now, around this time, and, you know, at some point I'll do a juvenile delinquency series. I'm kind of just brushing over all of this shit just so that I can set up the China series correctly so you know exactly, like, what's going on when we get there because I don't want to, like, leave stuff out. Um, but I'll do, like, a whole series where I describe this. So I started hanging out with this guy named Loper. He was, like, a good friend of ours um, back then. He was kind of a creep. He's kind of like Quagmire from Family Guy. He's always like, you know, he'd always say kind of like off the wall stuff, you know, he'd be like, dude, I wonder what a, I wonder what a bitch's shit tastes like. I bet that shit tastes fucking decent. He'd be like, what the fuck? Who says stuff like that? Taco. 
and Loper. Loper, <laughs> coincidentally, like, you know, and we'd go to, like, Santa Barbara, there's, like, a little college town, Isla Vista, right next to it, so, like, in high school, we were pretty much living, like, college kids, like, I, we'd go out there, and, like, do all sorts of crazy shit, threesomes, and getting, like, brawls all the time, just all sorts of weird shit in, in Isla Vista, so basically, it was, like, we were in college, and, you know, he'd always go out there, and he'd, like, fuck some random girl, he actually, coincidentally and kind of ironically he turned out to be like a super gnarly gay guy who has like who like like straight up like wears like assless chaps with like a with like a you know rainbow flag and like rides fucking horses to gay pride parades and i swear to god it's so weird like like what like you're fucking girls with us in, in high school like how does that happen like one day you're like pussy whack I'm going to try some dick now. Oh, dude. Dude. Pussy's so whack. Dick is so much bomber. I'm out of here. I'm going to change my profile picture to just a rainbow. That's what happened. And we're like, whoa, that's great. It's just kind of weird. So anyway, so through him, and he was a co kid. So that was like the common denominator between like my new social circle. I wasn't going to Santa Barbara High anymore, but I was like, you know, Sean was still going. So he'd bring like high school girls over. And I was like 16. We were all 16 at the time. Same age as me. And uh, we met that guy Loper and we started hanging out with him a lot. And we started going out to like, we go to like house parties and we go to these college parties. So anyway, he, um, <clears throat> at one point, um, and I had a car, I had a little 85 Volvo. So my parents would let me still drive, even though I got expelled. I don't remember like what the deal was. I think I had to work at a telem. I had to have like a job and I don't know why, but like for some reason I just stopped working or uh, stop. They stopped like making me do anything education wise when I was 16 for a while. I went back when I was 17, but I don't remember what happened or what I, what I was doing. But what I do remember is that I had this Volvo. So a lot of times Sean would be at school and I would just be at home snorting Coke by myself you know, snort Coke all day, big rails on like my, my, like, you know, my desk in my room. And I just be doing Coke all day, listening to music. And then Sean would come home and, you know, like then we would usually drink. Sometimes we did acid. Sometimes we did mushrooms. We'd go hiking together. We went, did a lot of surfing, skateboarding. I mean, we had, it was a pretty cool childhood, but, um, because I had a car, oftentimes people would call me like to do favors for them, drive them here, whatever people that still went to the high school. I was friends with this guy um, named Brennan and he was like the bit, he was like the Biff from back to the future. But like, that was like our school bully. And he had been that way since like sixth grade. Uh, I went to sixth grade with him before I got held back a grade. And he was just like the meanest, most fucked up kid I've ever met. You know, like a kid would like piss him off. He'd like get a screwdriver and like stab him in the eye with it. Like, fuck you. Like 12 years old, like doing psychotic Chucky shit like that. Um, and he really liked me because A, he thought I was funny. B, I was like a, a, a big time nerd back then. And he didn't know how to read. And like people, like he was really insecure about that. So we'd hang out and like we'd skateboard together, but letting them like on the low, like I was like teaching him how to read and stuff. So like he always had my back loyalty to me my whole life he actually being friends with him on the left i mean that guy went on to be like super hardcore and he's in he's probably doing like 30 years right now i think I, I something like that he got busted a few years ago on like a big ass case um but uh you know he would go on to like save me more times than i can count at like you know i'd be at like a keg party at like 16 17 right around this era that i'm talking about and I'd be like talking shit to someone. Like, yeah, well, you know what? Fuck you. What's up? And like, I'd be all wasted, like trying to fight someone. And then like the whole party would like gang up on me. And then he would just kind of like, he'd just come and be like, oh, you touch Ryan, I'll fuck all you up. He was a big, scary, intimidating guy. He had, um, he was just nuts. I could probably do a whole video series about this guy. He, um, like when he lost his virginity, just as an example. He, uh, he was like on an AOL chat room, he had to be like 11 or 12 and he was already a skinhead, you know, he's already white power. He's not like that anymore, but he was then. And like, you know, he like shaved my head cause he was like my best friend in sixth grade, shaved my head. He put up like a swastika flag in my room and my parents were like super liberal and they're just like, Oh, 
is just experimenting with culture. Oh, <laughs> well. Yeah, I'd like to hear my mom talking to her friends. Oh my God, yeah. Ryan, he's, he's hilarious. He's like going through some sort of Nazi phase right now. You know, like, the fuck, how's that normal? <laughs> my parents have always been kind of like, whatever I'm into, they're kind of like, okay, that's cool. You're into that. We'll support that, whatever it is. For real. Um, so he'd like be on this AOL chat room and he met these girls and they're like, you know what? You'd be pretty hot if you didn't have braces. These girls were like high school girls. It's like 11 or 12. And they were like skin birds, which is like female skinhead, like groupy sluts, right? And they're like, you know, if you didn't have braces, you'd be pretty hot. We'd fuck you. We'd take your virginity. So he went to his dad's garage. His parents were divorced. He's at his dad's house when it happened. Took out a pair of pliers and ripped them off of his teeth. And then he went and had a threesome with these like gross, like skinhead, like skanks from like, the high school that would have a threesome with like an 11 or 12 year old or whatever it was. Yeah. So he did that. Then another time, you know, his dad was an alcoholic and would beat him all the time. And he showed up at like a high school football game. This is when Brennan was in junior high. He was like all drunk. He's like, you need to come home, you little faggot. And Brennan was like, what? And he had a baseball bat, Brennan did. And he took it up to his dad. He hit him in the face and his dad got a concussion. Like he fractured his skull and everything. And then they sent him to like, uh, boot camp. He had to go to like juvenile, like boys camp, you know? And then he went there and he came out even more crazy. But anyway, the point is, is I stayed in contact with him and then he went to my high school and he was like the Biff. He really was. It was like some really like, I felt like I was in like some sixties movie or something. Like, you know, I'd be like walking down the hall and he'd like, he'd just be pushing some dork against the locker. He'd be like, give me your mom's credit card, bitch same time tomorrow and the kid's like okay you want her her security code too he's like yeah fuck you uh, white power then i'd just be like hey brother he'd be like hey run we'd like dap and i'd just keep going Shh. dogs are so annoying um this is why i don't do videos in the day they always do shit like this near a crew he's like shut up rocky they're not even our dogs so um anyway the point is it's like he was a bully he was crazy and I wasn't going to high school at the time. Sean was, I wasn't. And I was living at home and I was just doing coke and people would call me once in a while. So this guy, Brandon, calls me the school bully. And he would call me Loner. That was my nickname, you know, because back in the day he couldn't pronounce Leone. So he'd call me Loney. And then it just turned into Loner. He'd be like, what up, Loner? Um, I'm going to need you to, to do a mission for me. And I'm like, okay, anything you want, Brandon. I was like petrified of this guy. I was like, yeah, dude, I mean, if you want, if you want me to like um, finger bang your ass, I'm, I'm just going to say right now that I'm down, whatever it is. I was like that because I was like scared of this guy. So he, he had called me and he's like, I need you, loaner, I need you for a mission. So I had my Volvo. So I went and I picked him up at the high school, at this place called Lodi Lane, where we used to like smoke cigarettes and like we'd smoke weed and like play truth or dare and like, you know, girls would like give us blowjobs and stuff. I don't know. Just debaucherous shit kind of looking back i think that probably my high school experience was more debaucherous than other people's i don't know not really sure uh it just depends if you're a druggie then that's probably like a universal high school experience but anyway i went to go pick him up and i had no idea where we were going no idea he's not talking to me he's just like here put this on and he like puts on this like skinhead like punk rock called i think it's called screwdriver or something i'm not really sure screwdriver i think is a skinhead rock band it was like kill the jews kill the jews it would just say like shit like that like over and over again and like he like he would he just like sit there like all like like barely like hmm this shit's badass i'm like yeah bomb for sure really scared that he like at any moment he's gonna like cut my head off and put in a duffel bag or something so we end up going up to this house i'd never seen it before it was like up in the hills um up in this area called um montecito which is like you know the rich part of santa barbara it's where oprah winfrey lives and like a bunch of celebrities live there like the really really high like ritzy high class part of santa barbara and uh we drive up to this house and he's like loner just stay here and listen to the skinhead shit. I was like, okay. I'm like pretending like I'm into it. As soon as he leaves, I like turn it down. I'm like, oh my God, I feel so hateful. Just like 
being exposed to this weird propaganda for even for like 15 minutes or whatever it was. So then he comes back out and he has these huge, huge black trash bags. He's like, loner, I need your help. I was like, what is that? And he just puts it, he's like, open your trunk. So I open and he just puts these bags in my trunk. So I go with him and we go um, up into this house. Now this is a mansion in, say, in Montecito, probably worth, I don't know, $12 million house, huge, like 10 bedroom home, which you're probably like, what? That kind of house would get like a 50 bedroom home. No, not there. Uh, houses there are super expensive. Uh, but this was still like a relatively big place. Anyway, the entire house was was like a grow operation. There was like the whole mansion was there was no furniture. It was just hydroponics everywhere. Ballast hanging over or ballasts, and then there was like lights hanging over plants, and there was like the yo-yo, um, you know, the S hooks, and then there were the yo-yos, and then they had like mother plants, and they had all the uh, fluorescent lights and all the different stuff, timers, um, like chem it was just a huge grow operation. Most weed I'd ever seen, probably like hundreds of pounds and shit. And he's like, come on. And he was like, he was like, I only have four more trash bags. We'll come back. I'm like, okay. So I'm just like helping him clear this house out. So we end up like, I don't know. We run out of trash bags and I'm like, just, he's like, just take as much. I'm like stuffing hands full of, I'm like ripping plants apart. There's like fresh buds everywhere. There's like cured stuff. There's like um, plants that haven't matured. There's stuff that hadn't yielded yet. We're taking as much shit as we can. We fill up as many trash bags as he has. Fill up my car. It's probably like, who, I don't even know. We probably got like 50 pounds or something, like quite a bit of weed. And like at that age, I, unheard of. You know, if I saw like a quarter pound, I was like, we could get in a lot of trouble for this, guys. This is not good. Because back then, like weed was still kind of like illegal. It's not anymore. It's crazy. My house got raided like six months ago by the police, by the probation department, parole and, and like the task force. There was a pound of weed. There was a bag of weed this big. And I'm like, guys, I got this. They're like, yeah, we're not tripping on that. I was like, what? Just shows you how like they don't care about it anymore. So anyway, so we ended up like robbing this house for the most part. Well, that's exactly what it was. We robbed this house. And like, we listened to that, like, yeah, for kill the Jews, kill, kill black people. Ah. I was like, Jesus Christ. So we're like going back and we go back to my parents' house. He's like, thanks, loner. He's like, here, let's stash this at your parents' house. I'm like, dude, 50 pounds of weed is going to stink. He's like, they'll never know. I'm like, okay. So like we stash it like in their lower garage, we keep going and I drop them back off at school. You know, it just looked ridiculous. Like him bumping the skinhead music. We just pulled off this huge weed heist and he has like this like like red backpack and he just like puts it on. He's like, all right, thanks loner. And he's like a high school kid again and just walks back away, takes his screwdriver CD and you know, goes. So this weeds at my parents' house for a while. My, my, my parents are like, oh my God, it smells like pot. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. My dad's like, you know what? I, and my dad smokes weed, you know? He smokes weed to this day. And he's, you know, but back then he would like pretend like, oh, this is horrible. Oh, don't do this. And then like, I'd find like roaches. Like, oh, I'm like, what? Don't you, you, but you blaze it. What do you mean? So like, yeah, but don't be like me. You don't want to end up like me. I'm like, what, in a multi-million dollar house, successful? What are you talking about? Doesn't sound bad to me. Maybe I should smoke more weed. He's like, yeah, no, I mean, no, yeah, uh. It was always hard for him to like, you know, I don't know. It's hard to tell people not to smoke weed when you're successful, you know? Like, oh, don't do this. Do not, I, like, I'm like one in like 10, you know? Like, I smoke weed and like nothing happened. But like, some people smoke weed and then they like you know, they give hand jobs and shit for like fresh plants. Yeah, it happened. You know what? I mean, what can you tell someone that's like, you know, successful? You can't really say anything to that. So anyway, so this weed stays in my house for a while. Brendan eventually comes and gets it. Uh, he's like, he's like, thanks loner for your work. I'm going to give you three pounds. And I was like, he's like, of shake and trim. Whoa. And I was like, 
oh, I was like, bro, that's so nice of you. Thank you. I was so stoked on that, just to have pounds of anything. Like, it, you know, it was the most we'd ever had. Plus, I was like a full-fledged coke head back then. So, like, now, like, we're making gravity bongs with, like, my parents' sparklets water jugs. We, like, just cut them in half, like, put it in their pool and, like, gravity bong it and, like, blow out these, like, massive chimney fucking, you know, cannons of smoke. And it's pretty, pretty hardcore. I started selling pre-rolled joints. That was like my new hustle. And like, I started making a lot of money and I started selling cocaine um, with that money so that I could do cocaine. And right around that time, um, that guy Loper had introduced me to a guy named Orlando, who actually went on to be like a pretty well-known musician. Uh, his name is, uh, maybe I shouldn't say, but it doesn't really matter. That's not the name that he goes by, but you guys would definitely know who he is if I said it, but it doesn't really matter. So, um, you know, we started hanging out with this guy, Orlando. Now, Orlando was from Europe. His parents were split up and his dad, like, was one of those dads that just didn't care, you know, like, would let us, like, pretty much do whatever we want. Like, he'd, like, come home, he'd be like, hey, how you guys doing? There'd be, like, 10 girls, like, in whipped cream and, like, that, you know, we'd have like one on a leash, like barking and we're like, you know, manually like sticking bananas down her throat. And he'd be like, Hey, uh, don't stay up too late. All right. Uh, I'm going to go upstairs and read. And we're like, okay, good seeing you, man. And go back to feeding her the banana. Like he just didn't give a fuck. He was insane. Like the debauchery that went down at this place. It was nuts. And this guy was a cokehead too. And like one time, uh, you know, like we'd like go into his Coke if we were out of Coke. And one time, like we did it all by mistake. And Orlando's like, fuck, what am I going to do, guys? I'm like, I don't know. I have ketamine. He's like, okay, fuck it. And we just like replaced the Coke with ketamine. Who knows whatever happened? That's so fucked up. Those dad probably did a fat line and went into a K hole and was like, Ugh. but uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter. So, um, uh, okay. So we started like that was the start. That was always like the designated party house. And it's where we partied hard starting sophomore year. This went on for years too. Uh, just like I said, wild ass debauchery went down at this house. Crazy shit that I probably wouldn't even talk about. Maybe, maybe on the hundred dollar tier. Just kidding. Uh, but really like kind of fucked up shit happened at that house. Um, and so, you know, Sean would go there with me. I'd go there. And Sean total, totaled his car around that time. The must it was a Mustang. You know, I asked somebody, it was a Mustang, but I guess it only has two doors, and the passenger door got that's what broke off. Or four door Mustangs, but uh, he did have a Mustang, and he, he totaled it. So basically, I was the only one with the car. And it was like a five minute drive from my parents' house down to Orlando's dad's house. And uh, so I'm doing coke. I'm selling it. I got all these pounds of weed. Um, and I'm selling like pre-rolled joints. Like things are going pretty good for me. So one night, um, they, my, uh, Orlando calls me. He's like, Hey brother. It's like two in the morning. He's like, what's up, bro? Um, he's like, Hey, it's like, Hey, I got these, uh, I got these bitches over here. And like, they're looking through the yearbook. They didn't, they went to a different school than our, than ours. Um, and like, they're looking through a yearbook and, uh, I guess one of the girls here thinks you're hot and pretty much if you come over now, she'll fuck you. And I was like, what? Dude, it's two in the morning. I'm, no, it's just like, okay, cool. I'll be right there. Like got my car, snuck out, went there. And this chick's name was Jill. I talk about her in, um, in Wasting Talent. So she actually wasn't in high school, but the two, the two other girls were, and I still know all of these girls to this day, but, uh, and, like they're all really good friends of mine and they're like normal people they're like you know they're like teachers and like have like their masters and shit but back then they were just like wild druggy sluts and uh so i go over there this girl jill's like pretty good you know not what i was expecting at two in the morning unexpectedly i'm all coked out and uh this is the weirdest shit i like get to this house and she's like hey i think you're beautiful let's fuck i was like okay cool went into like one of his guest rooms and i just had sex with her and like afterwards i was like hey um are we like boyfriend and girlfriend now and she's like mm-hmm, for sure and so we started dating she was actually uh i think she was 19 yeah she was 19 when i met her no tw- oh 
20 when I met her. She was 20 and I was 16. And uh, they were all doing coke at their house. And I guess they had just showed her pictures. Um, she was like a grade ahead of these other girls. Yeah. They were seniors. She was already in college. She was a freshman at the community college. They were seniors, but they all knew each other because they all went to the same high school. That's it. And um, so basically that summer, uh, we started, um, you know, we like partied over there all the time. And I started dating this girl, Jill. And her dad was a Coke dealer. He was um, for, and part of a biker club. So he's getting like, I don't know, like quarter keys, half keys, stuff like that. And then I was already selling Coke and she sold Coke too. So now we were like dating each other and we were both Coke dealers and she was in college and she drove like a convertible and she'd always like sleep over at my house. And my parents were like, who's this like 20 year old that is like sleeping over all the time? That's weird. And I was like, I don't know. She's just like my spiritual guide. My dad's like, oh, okay. My mom's like, Ryan. He's just into such silly stuff. Now he's not a Nazi, but now he hangs out with some gypsy that's 20, and I guess she's helping him with spirituality. I don't know. You know these kids these days. They're crazy. And Sean was fucking her friend, too. Uh, like It was like those three girls, like Orlando got one, Sean got one, I got one. Sean was already over there when they called me. I don't know why I wasn't there, but I was like at home for some reason. I was probably grounded or something. I don't remember. And uh, so because I was dating her and because she sold Coke and her dad was selling her Coke, um, I kind of started like partying with an older crowd, you know? And I turned 17 that summer. So uh, this was the summer of 02. And I was hanging out with her and all these freshmen in college. And I was like tweaking out on Coke all the time. I was getting worse and worse on Coke. So, um, one night we were at Orlando's house. I was whacked out. I'd probably been up four days. I was like losing a lot of weight. Um, I still had like the dyed black hair, but I was like, I just looked like a straight up teenage junkie, you know? And like I was pacing. I'm a pacer. I'm a natural pacer. Anyway, I pace, pace, pace. I noise the shit out of Karina pace. And uh, I'm there with like her and there's like all these older guys there, older girls, Orlando's there, a bunch of people there that night. And she's like, you need to chill. Like you need to take something to relax. Do you want a Valium? And I'm like, yeah. So I take a Valium and I'm just like, it will, doesn't, doesn't even phase me. She's like, do you want to smoke opium? And I was like, sure. And so she gives me black tar heroin for the first time. Never even seen it didn't know it was heroin she didn't say that I would have done it if I had known that but um but she didn't tell me it was that either she told me it was opium so I just did it and I smoked it on tinfoil and I remember instantly loving it I was like oh I love this this is way better than coke fuck coke like it was like finding that was like finding my my drug of choice and this is like stuff I'll cover at some point in juvenile delinquency I'm just trying to give you like the chronology since you guys asked for the China story so now um you know I'm on heroin and Santa Barbara High lets me back in junior year so now it's the fall of 2002 and I'm doing heroin every single day uh I've probably been doing it you know since I don't know, probably since like June, July of the summer. Um, and I'm like completely fucked up on it. Smoking it in a tin foil, getting these little black like snail trails going down the foil, smoking it with dollar bills, like in the bathroom at my high school, going to my friend and just be like, I'm on heroin, I'm fucking dope. And people would be like, dude, that's, <laughs> that's lame. I'm like, nah. Uh -uh. Someday I'm going to write a book in federal prison about heroin and if I didn't do heroin, I couldn't do that. No, I didn't say that. But I thought it was super like, I thought it was like some sort of rock star outlaw. So I'm doing a lot of heroin, strung out on it. If I don't get heroin, I, uh, if I don't get, hold on. I'm waiting for an important uh, phone call. If I don't get heroin, I'm getting sick. So I'm strung out. Uh, Jill and I, are still together at this point. We've been together now like seven or eight months, maybe a little less than that. But anyway, so I'm doing bad and I'm in high school. My grades are kind of better, but not really. And my parents 
are suspicious. That, I mean, they knew I was on drugs the whole time. So my dad comes and tells me that, uh, so it's like, I don't know, probably like October of 2002. My dad tells me that he's going to China on a business trip and that um, he wants to include me. He's like, do you want to go to Asia with me for a month? I was like, I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. I asked Sean about it. He's like, hell yeah, go to China. He's like, I would go. I was like, yeah, all right. So I told my dad, I was like, yeah, 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 I'll go. My dad's like, yeah, you can skateboard and like, I'll let you drink the whole time. I don't even care. It's like, okay, cool. Sounds good. Now, I didn't really realize the extent of how bad I was strung out on heroin because I hadn't been doing it that long. I'd probably been doing it like, I don't know, four or five months, whatever the case was, but doing it long enough where I had a habit and I'd get sick if I didn't do it. So, um, you know, I'm, it's like, I'm going to be taking a month off of school and I'm thinking like, you know, okay, I'm going to be in China for about a month. I should probably bring a month's worth of heroin. Now, back then, a gram of heroin was like $30. This was back in 2002. It was way cheaper back then. I don't know why. Maybe it was just because like we had, God, this dog's annoying the fuck out of me. You see, this is why I don't do stuff until much later because of the noise. It's so bad. Um, um, okay, so anyway, um, I started like, trying to figure out exactly how much heroin I was going to need and like how much it was going to cost me. And like I did the math and it was going to cost me like thousands of dollars. I was like, fuck, because I wanted to bring a little extra. Um, but still, I had access to savings bonds, you know, which eventually I get like $80,000 worth. So, oh my God, they drive me nuts. Um, so like, you know, to get that money, to liquidate those savings bonds, you know, like later when I was 18 and I had to fly my girl, uh, Kate, out from Massachusetts to here, I just went through and broke the attic and got like $80,000 worth all in one shot. But my parents would have like stacks of them, like a $500 one, $200, $100 one. And so I could like slowly start cashing them and build up money. But to get like three or four thousand dollars, you know, I'd have to cash like a two hundred, five hundred. It took a while. So I had, I don't know. He told me probably about a month before we were going. I had time where I, I started cashing um, savings bonds because I knew that you know I think you could get a piece back then for like I don't know three or four hundred dollars, which is twenty five grams. I think I was going to do that and then get like another six pack on top of it. So I was going to have like 31 grams, something like that. I don't know. Whatever the case was, I was going to get thousands of dollars worth of heroin. I was going to balloon them and I was going to put them, some of them like in my luggage, like just like kind of lace my stuff. I, I didn't know anything about smuggling drugs internationally or like what could possibly happen. Um, I just had kind of like a haphazard, you know, I had this like underdeveloped plan where I was going to somehow smuggle it with my luggage. So I'm getting ready to go. And because I'm going to be missing a month of school, um, my English teacher, my dad goes to him and like basically asks him if he can help make my curriculum for a month so I can do like homeschooling while I'm there. You know, my English teacher is like, well, why don't we make the curriculum based on him being in Asia since it's kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So they start like my English teacher and some of the other teachers start making me curriculum that like every like in history class write reports about the history of china in english keep a diary every day while i'm there and then like he'll grade it when i get back and talk about all the different experiences i'm having uh and so on and so forth and i'm getting ready to go my dad's like hey um he's like you know i trust you but i gotta ask are you planning on bringing any drugs or anything and i was like no, why would I do that? Uh, okay, why would I do that? And he goes, um, well, I don't know, Ryan. You are a drug addict. I'm like, dad, smuggling drugs internationally? How stupid do you think I am? He's looking at me and I have like dyed black hair. You know, I look like such an idiot, <laughs> you know? And he's like, I want to show you a movie. So he shows me this movie called Midnight Express. 
I don't know if you guys have ever um, heard of that, but it was Oliver St the first movie Oliver Stone ever wrote. It was based on a true story, and it was one of the episodes of Locked Up Abroad. And it was about a guy that tried to smuggle hash out of Turkey into the United States. He was an American citizen, young guy, college kid, and he tried to smuggle hash into the United States from Turkey. He ended up getting a life sentence. He got butt fucked by like super heavy set like Turkish guards. Um, like a cat got was hanged like all sorts of crazy fucked up shit happened i was like 17 or yeah i was 17 i was like oh my god i mean the movie my dad knew what he was doing he knew that to show me that movie it would completely dissuade me from trying to smuggle drugs into china um but you gotta remember back then um well and still this day i'm a complete compulsive fucking idiot so that we'll get into the whole China series in the next video, but I wanted to use this one to kind of like build up to it so you know kind of exactly what kind of person I was uh, while I was in China. Because I think if I just got right into the China story, it would be like kind of out of context. Okay, guys, I appreciate you. I'm going to go to sleep now. I just completely made that up, but I don't know. I'm going to do something, probably eat or something. Okay, I appreciate you guys. Palabra.